So good afternoon. I'm Stephanie Young, and I am the Executive Director of the 351 Club of Vermont. And I want to officially call our 66th annual meeting to order. Yeah, 66. Thank you. Thank you for being here with us today, and welcome to those members who are watching the live stream of the meeting via ORCA. We are glad that so many members have an opportunity to today to join us, either in person or online. This marks my first meeting as executive director, or my second me annual meeting as executive director, but my first in person. As we are all aware, last year we could not meet in person due to COVID, and we only met online. With the widespread availability of the COVID vaccine, we were able to plan this year's meeting as an in-person gathering, but also enhance the annual meeting by adding the live stream option for those who could not join us in person. I heard from so many members that the club was an important part of their getting through the pandemic, with members traveling locally when we could not go out of state to see family and friends or gather at large events, this year, while we continue to grapple with challenges from the pandemic and the Delta variant, I know we are grateful and thankful to be here in person today. During 2021, we continued to hear from many of you about your 251 adventures. From the high school, high school senior who joined our club when his school went remote and he finished his quest, to a member who walked across the entire state and was also featured in the last newsletter, the friends who completed their quest on motorcycles and made sure to stop for ice cream along the way, and other members who completed their quest with their partners, children, and even dogs as companions. We also heard from members who continue to come up with unique themes of how to explore the state, including visiting historical markers, taking a nature picture in each town that they go to, or visiting town offices or town clerk offices to get the inside scoop of where to go. And I actually just spoke to a member who is doing that um, at today's meeting. As executive director, I enjoy so much hearing your stories about the unique journeys through our state. At this meeting, each year we also report on the club's accomplishments and important developments. In 2021, the club continued to have a strong membership base. We have new members joining us, some of you who are in the room today for your first annual meeting, and also members renewing. Thanks to your support through memberships and 251 Club merchandise purchases, and your attendance here today, either in person or virtual, the club is in a strong financial position to continue to grow and provide value to our members. This year, the 250 Club of One, 251 Club of Vermont also was faced with a challenge related to our website. Earlier this year, we found out that we had to move our website to a new platform because the platform we had been using was no longer supported. I know many of you have grown accustomed to the old website, but we had to take it down and we had to build a new one. The good news is, is we were able to get our new website up and running with minimum downtime during the transition from the old site. As a small nonprofit, Updating the website and moving to a new platform has been a significant undertaking for us. We continue to make improvements and appreciate your patience as we continue to work on the website and make it as user-friendly as we can for all of you. As much as we love visiting towns and cities in Vermont, we also love talking about the 251 Club. And I imagine all of you are having some great conversations at your tables talking about your journey. The 251 Club has been featured in several articles and podcasts in 2021, including Happy Vermont and WDEV's Vermont Viewpoints. We've also been featured in Seven Days earlier this year, and we will have a upcoming article in the fall edition of the Vermont Magazine, which has generously donated a copy of their summer publication to all of you today. Members have also been featured in several news outlets in 2021, including the Caledonian Record and the Herald, and their retelling of their 251 stories and through their passion has motivated others to join. With all that being said, we would like to thank all of you again for your support. I would also like to thank our board of directors and appreciate their hard work on behalf of the club. 
Thank you. And if the board of directors don't mind standing to be recognized. Thank you to all of you. Before we move to our keynote speaker for today's meeting, I want to recognize that during 2021, we were saddened to lose one of our board members, Jack Carter, who passed away in June. We are so grateful that Jack's family members, Ted, Jim, and Susan, can be with us today. And now we will be hearing from board member John Dumville about what Jack meant to the 251 Club and the community as a whole. I would now like to turn it over to John. is one of these things I wish I didn't have to do. Um, in June, Jack Carter of Waterbury, a board member of the 251 Club, passed away peacefully at home. The world needs more people like Jack. Um, in Waterbury, he was known as the mayor of Stowe Street because of his involvement. When Jack saw something that needed doing, he would say, why not? And would gather people together and do it, and do it with perfection. He was a true community builder, and he made whatever he do, do, do fun and educational. Jack never did anything halfway. Jack was born in the Connecticut town known as the birthplace of Vermont, and I don't have to say the name because 251 Club would know what town that was. And after attending St. Michael's College, he moved to the Big Apple to enter the retail business before returning to Vermont's big city on Lake Champlain. Shortly thereafter, he and his lifelong partner, Ted, moved to Waterbury and founded the So Street Empor Emporium and worked tirelessly and successfully to revitalize the town. Jack was chair of the 251 Club and, and as a PLUS member, visited every town in the state. He was a true lover of history, especially Vermont history, and had the talent and ability to bridge the gap to make the past relevant for today. He served on many boards and commissions in Waterbury. He was the ever quiet showman. He was a popular and a popular tour leader at the Vermont State House. At the time of his passing, he was co-chair with the Friends of the Vermont State House and worked hard to expand the diversity of the State House collection. He was especially proud to lead the challenge to commission an oil portrait of Alexander Twilight the first African-American man known to have earned a bachelor degree in a college, American University, and to serve in Vermont as the first African-American legislator um, before the Civil War. Jack em amplified what it meant to be a community leader and is proud to be a Vermonter. And we miss him as chair of the Friends of Vermont State House and the 251 Club. He would do anything to help people. He's a great man. Thank you. Thank you, John, for those kind words about Jack, who is dearly missed by all of us. We are now pleased to introduce our keynote speaker, Molly Vasey, of the Old Stone, Old Stone House Museum in Historic Village. As many of you may have read in the Summer 351 Club newsletter, the Old Stone House Museum and Historic Village is located in Brownington, Vermont, and helps tell the story of that region and Alexander Twilight. My children and I had a chance to visit the Old Stone House Museum in the summer of 2020 in order to check off Brownington from our 251 list. We signed up for what was to be a 45 minute tour, and it ended up being a two hour tour because we were so fascinated by the story and by the tour guide, who I've told Molly about, uh, that we, we just couldn't get enough um, at, the, at the museum. My boys at the time were six and 10, and so when they overheard me talking about who should be our keynote speaker for today, my oldest immediately piped up with, Mom, you need to go and you need to contact the Old Stone House Museum. And I could not agree more. I am so thrilled to have Molly here with us today. So after Molly speaks, we'll have time for a little bit of Q&A. And with that, I'd like to now turn it over to Molly. Thank you so much.
Thank you so much, Stephanie, for that warm welcome. Hello, 251 Club of Vermont members. I want to thank you for welcoming me this year to your annual meeting. My name is Molly Vasey, Executive Director of the Old Stone House Museum and Historic Village in Brownington, Vermont. It is my great pleasure to speak to this group, especially as your travels through Vermont have surely brought you unfor to unforgettable places in our state. And I'm here to tell you the story of a great man in his corner of the Green Mountains, in my view, one of the most peacefully and humbly magnificent places on earth. The opportunity to speak to you on this day is made all the more special by the fact that as right now as I speak at the Old Stone House Museum and Historic Village, we are holding the last of our season's events in celebration of this great man's 226th birthday. The hero of our story at the Old Stone House is African-American Alexandra Lucius Twilight. Born in Corinth, Vermont in September of 1795, Mr. Twilight was born into a mixed race family. His father, Ichabod, was of African-American descent and his mother, Mary, was white. At an early age, Mr. Twilight was indentured to neighboring farm families, working his way through his primary and secondary educational years. With determination and sharp intellect, he earned his way into Middlebury College as a third year student. He was matriculated in 1829 and graduated from Middlebury, becoming the first person of African-American descent to have ever graduated a United States college. After a, after a few short-term teaching positions in Vermont and New York and meeting his lifelong partner and wife, Mercy Ladd Merrill, the Twilight settled for good in the somewhat newly minted town of Brownington <laughs> in 1829. For Alexander, Brownington would become, and I quote, the home of my choice, the place and the students to which he dedicated his career, his life, and his considerable genius. Over the span of the next 28 years, the Twilights built an educational hub in Brownington along the prominent and historically important Hinman Settler Road that at the time connected the central part of the state to its northernmost regions and the Canadian border. In the first several years of his tenure as headmaster of the Orleans County Grammar School, which was a secondary school, and minister of the Brownington Congregational Church, the Twilights built their home, now known as the Twilight House. And in the years to follow, Mr. Twilight built the four-story dormitory, granite, called Athenian Hall, specifically to house his growing population of on-site students. It is fabled, and I'll just make a, a quick note, this is one of my favorite stories, that Twilight built an om it, that beautiful structure, that four-story granite edifice, almost by himself with the help of his little ox. This impressive building was constructed using granite blocks and the first three floors featured a kitchen, a dining room, a parlor, 14 student rooms, and six recitation rooms. And the fourth floor consisted of two classrooms, one of them a 20 by 40 foot assembly room, which probably was large enough to accommodate the entirety of the student body. Mr. Twilight was known for the care and attention he gave to his students, intellectual and moral growth. The diversity of curricula was a testament to this. Offering courses per ter term in a shockingly wide variety of subjects, including trigonometry, geometry, vocal music, astronomy, surveying, natural theology, botany, logic, philosophy, and more. The list literally goes on. And an even more surprising twist, the Twilights housed both their male and their female students, ages 12 to 18 roughly, in Athenian Hall together, only separated by one floor between them. While we're not sure how Alexander Twilight portrayed his own identity, we know his students often described him as, quote, bronzed or swarthy, they also recounted him as a strict but mirthful teacher, always appreciating a good rouse. All these factors made for an extraordinarily progressive model of education for the era. He implemented place-based, highly experiential learning where boys' and girls' minds were honored under the laws of nature. In 1836, the same year Mr. Twilight finished building the massive gra granite dormitory, he also was elected to the Vermont State House of Representatives becoming the first person of African-American descent in the nation to be an elected state official. Mr. Twilight was in many ways a controversial figure. 
He was a man of forceful will and conviction, not easily swayed by contrary opinions, and found himself in the opposition of his board on numerous occasions, and was even fired for a short period starting in 1847. During this hiatus from Brownington, he started a new academy in Canada before being invited to return in 1852. He died only a few years after returning to Brownington. Through the omniscient lens of retrospect, there is no doubt that Alexander Twilight made an impactful contribution to our history. Across the span of his career, he educated almost 3,000 students. Almost 1,000 of them were girls. His students would go on to achieve their own major contributions, both countrywide and locally. The Old Stone House Museum has long celebrated the Twilights as the protagonists of our local story. Their focus on academic and spiritual study infused many generations of Vermonters. Not having any children of their own, the Twilights didn't pass on a familial legacy, but they certainly left a physical one. Now it is the historic village, a bucolic compilation of eight historic buildings and 60 green acres in the heart of the NEK. Twilight's amazing four-story dormitory is now used as our museum, where we exhibit and interpret collections from in and around Orleans County. Alexander Twilight and the students who passed through his, his halls also left behind an undeniable and almost palpable energy that continues to drive our work to this day. On Juneteenth of 2020, as a result of a collaboration between our museum and local representatives, a concurrent resolution was passed that by the Vermont State Legislature, naming Alexander Twilight Day on September 23rd, his birthday. That day each year is now regarded as a statewide day of recognition of this remarkable Vermonter. Shortly after, a letter from Congressman Peter Welch was entered into congressional record, recognizing the same. As a result of this statewide proclamation, the Friends of the State House, as you heard intimated recently, um, commissioned an artist to paint the portrait of Mr. Twilight to grace the halls of our beautiful State House forever. The Old Stone House is proud to have begun this long overdue acknowledgement of Alexander Twilight, one of this state's most admirable leaders. We now use three words to inform our mission, preservation, inspiration, and education. Alexander Twilight inspires us to use these three platforms to explore the diversity of our own local history. Other inspiring individuals from diverse backgrounds and their contribution to our collective progress. Our educational programs now reach over 700 children and an equal or greater number of adults annually. We try to honor the legacy of his progressive hands-on and experiential learning he left to us and in the very same places he called his home 226 years ago. Today at the Old Stone House Museum and Historic Village, we are celebrating his birthday and making a renewed commitment to the stories of diversity like Twilight's through our area's history. It is so important now, perhaps more than ever, to recognize the brave front runners of our society, to see these people as examples to learn from and by whom and by which to create a richer, deeper, and more complex understanding of ourselves. As one of my trustees recently described, and I quote her now, history matters. Our understanding of the past helps us to face our future. We have to look for ways of teaching hope. When you arrive at our historic village in Brownington, you will immediately understand the hope that perennially springs from our local histories. The places we come from and the places we live and the great people like Alexander Twilight who paved the way. Often in these commemorative speeches about Twilight and the educational vi village he built in Brownington, there's reference to an article that Irisberg, our, my friend, um, an Irisberg author, Howard Frank Mosier, wrote for Vermont Life. I've tried, and I have, tried to think of other ways to describe the force of the quiet wellspring of history that is found there, but I have never found a better expression than Mosier's words. Let me quote him now. I like the way the stone hill house still looms upon that hilltop where the wind blows all the time. There it sits, unshaken and monolithic, as I write this sentence 
and as you read it, every bit as astonishing today as the day it was completed. What a tribute to the faith of its creator, the Reverend Alexander Twilight, scholar, teacher, preacher, legislator, husband, father away from home, to nearly 3,000 boys and girls, an African-American and a Vermonter of great heart, great steadfastness, and great vision, whose remains today lie buried in the churchyard just up the maple-lined dirt road from his granite school. And what surely was, and still is, one of the last best places anywhere. It still gets to me, sorry. <laughs> I think that um, it gets to me every time because it is so poignantly true. There is not a better expression to describe the place and the person. With that, I open up the floor to a Q&A. Is there anything you would all like to know more about Twilight or anything about our village? Yes, sir. First of all, I, I want to mention, I, my wife and I visited the, uh, your establishment and the stone house, and it was amazing that whoever was in charge that day said, there's a stone house, just go ahead and visit. There were no signs, don't touch anything. Every room was more interesting than the last. It's a fabulous place. That's, that's my plug, but I, but I did want to ask, ask um, uh, you mentioned this, this vast array of academic courses that were offered. What, I, what I'd like to know, in addition to Mr. Twilight, uh, who was the faculty? Were there other instructors, and where did they come from, and yeah. what did they teach? Sure, so Twilight was indeed a genius and could certainly teach an array of especially science, technology, math. So if we're talking about like contemporary education and we've got the STEM and STEAM related um, tools that educators use today, he, Twilight was doing all those things. He had an electromagnetic machine, you know, he was doing vacuums in a bottle to to do um, experimentation on, on air um, pressure and so forth. He was really cutting edge when it came to science and math. Um, but he would hire out certainly for things like vocal music. Um, and especially uh, he was at, at one point pressured by the board to hire a female um, teacher as well to kind of accommodate and, and make sure that the female students' needs were being met as well. Um, so he had on staff anywhere from two to five other people during per, per term. And in the busy ones, he may have more. Other questions? Yes, ma'am. That's a great question. It's um, hard to compare. So, uh, you know, it was dollars and cents in that era, but it was probably comparative to, um, you know, a fairly high-scale private school in, in our contemporary times. So, you know, I mean, you can look back on the, on the syllabus and it will say, you know, $5, it was per course, $5 and some odd cents per term or whatnot, and then you could choose your course syllabus as well as a student. So you could take vocal music and astronomy one term um, and then choose from another set, subset of, um, of courses the next, and you would pay per class. Yes, ma'am. The uh, Old Stone House Day? Yes, yes, we, um, we did this year again in person, which was great. We missed it in 2020. Um, and yep, we plan on doing it uh, in 2022 as well. It's always about the second Sunday of August. And um, just so you're aware too, I did leave a bunch of materials out on um, the tables in the entryway. There are, there's a 2021 season calendar and schedule that is, you know, our last event of the season is happening right, right now. So um, we have virtual offerings all winter, but the, the season will open again in May of 2022. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm from Bennington County and originally from Connecticut, and I still think of myself as a Connecticut resident. And I've been mentoring several, un the words have to be so politically correct, but just say these days, <laughs> underprivileged or students that are learning, processing, as they say, in different ways. And I'm just sometimes very appalled, and I don't mean to offend any teachers, at the subject matter that is created for kids to write reports on. And there's, there's just no facts. I mean, just with the story you've told today, 
Um, I hope some of that material can be mailed to teachers uh, for lack of, I, I don't know, I, I, don't, I only know the students that I work with and I see the deficiencies in reading and math and just general knowledge about Vermont, the state that they live in and the state that many of them will stay in. And, and when I see the homework assignments, uh, pretend you are this and how would you send that message out? And what, when we have such wonderful facts and stories here, so all that to say, the more you can shift or send some of that material or even have a grant <coughs> from our own Vermont State that <coughs> provides opportunities for you to mail information like this to the schools. Yeah, thank you for that comment. It is true, and I was um, just having this conversation to some degree at our table, too. The, um, you know, the Northeast Kingdom, because of its size and population, sometimes has stories remarkable in nature that aren't necessarily shared widely um, through the state of Vermont or e even regionally. Alexander Twilight's starting to make his way into a statewide story, which is wonderful. But how many others, and that's what we're committed to right now, um, how many other stories of diversity or wonderful leadership that's um, in our own region's history that we can now explore and celebrate as part of our exploration and celebration of Mr. Twilight. But yes, thank you. Yeah. Also, you read this, the life history of Frederick Douglass, a right. slave. I mean, when I'm reading his biography, obviously that he wrote, I need a dictionary for some of the words. <laughs> <laughs> and it just astounds me that this is a man that, you know, wasn't in preschool and um, early school. So many of these people that have excelled in this manner, it's, it's Twilight, it's Douglas, it's Booker T. Washington. They've, they've been in different corners of our United States of America and all very gifted people. So it's a common thread when there is ambition and intelligence. There is no glass ceiling. That is so true. Any other questions I can answer? Yes, ma'am. Yes. Thank you. As, a, as an alum of Linden State College, there are two names from that campus mm -hmm. I encountered when we visited Brownington on our 251 quest. One is Alexander Twilight, and he spoke so eloquently. But the other is Samuel Reed Hall. Mm -hmm. Would you say a little yeah. bit about that? Yes. So um, Samuel Reed Hall starts to... Um, so Twilight built this educational hub in Brownington, and there were other contingent stories that came out of that era and that kind of unbelievable progressive educational facility that, that kind of sprung up there. Samuel Reed Hall was a contemporary of Twilight's. Um, he lived, and we now care take after his former home. We use it as an Airbnb, actually, <laughs> on site. Um, Samuel Reed Hall House, he lived there, and he also started during the same era as Alexander Twilight was teaching in the grammar school, he started the first teacher's program, um, it, you know, it nationally, a formalized teacher's program. So many of the female and male, but female students that came out of the Orleans County Grammar School who were bound and destined to be teachers themselves may have gone on to, um, to study under Samuel Reed Hall uh, as further teacher's program. And so he all, another really interesting factoid about Samuel Reed Hall um, is that he really contemporized or mainstreamed the use of the, the blackboard um, in the American classroom. There, were other, there are other great stories as well that kind of come out from the, you know, the hub, the wheel and the spokes um, as, as, uh, from Alexander's core story, and he's one of the most amazing ones. So, yes, ma'am. Great question. He drew students from the northern tier of Vermont primarily. He also drew a few students from New Hampshire. And he drew a number of students actually from lower and middle Canada, um, so the, from the Quebec and Ontario regions of Canada. So he had quite a draw. His magnetism, especially you know, before the days of social media or um, really quick communication, that's a pretty amazing feat. So before I leave you today, um, I wanted to highlight just a few other local attractions you might consider visiting in your travels through Vermont. 
And maybe you have already, so you'll have to excuse me if some of this is re repetitive for some of you. The Old Stone House Museum and Historic Village really enjoys a robust partnership program with a lot of other organizations. Um, and I would encourage you all, if you haven't already, to explore some of, some of these places in our region as well with deep, meaningful ties to the Old Stone House. In Glover, of course, there's the famous Bread and Puppet Theater and the Museum of Everyday Life, which are closely connected places of interest. In Craftsbury, we have a very interrelated history with Craftsbury that is very directly tied to Twilight. Um, just give you a quick snippet about that. In 1836, Twilight went to Montpelier as a representative to literally thwart the opening of another Orleans County Grammar School in Craftsbury, which, where it was proposed, featuring that the, uh, or fearing that the competition would split the student, the available student body in half, and neither institution would thrive. Later, the Craftsbury Academy eventually opened, despite Twilight's objections, and Mr. George Washington Henderson was hired as the headmaster and minister of that institution. Mr. Henderson was a black man. He was born a slave in Clark County, Virginia, in 1850, and mostly illiterate when he arrived in Vermont in 1865. Henderson re received his education at the Underhill Academy, followed by college at the Berry Academy, and graduated from UVM first in his class in 1877. Henderson then went on to have an outstanding career in Craftsbury and then moved on into academia later in his career. So Craftsbury is a very interesting place, very interconnected histories. We also have partners in Caledonia County in the NEK, including the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium, in Catamount Arts Center, both in St. Johnsbury. Our friends at Northwood Stewardship Center are well worth visiting, and their grounds and programs reflect the rare beauties of the Northeast Kingdom. And don't forget the majesty of the Northeast Kingdom's lakes, Willoughby in Westmore, Crystal Lake in Barton, Lake Seymour in Morgan, Parker Pond in Glover, Caspian Lake in Greensboro, Lake Memphremagog in Newport, and we can go into the ponds too, but the list does go on there as well. <laughs> there is so much to explore and celebrate in the NEK and the Old Stone House Museum and Historic Village as at the beating heart of it all. Our season is coming to a close, as I mentioned, on October 17th, but we will have pre-booked tours up until that point, so please come and visit us if you can. You can book your tour, of course, online. We look forward to seeing you soon. Hopefully you'll all be able to come visit. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you, Molly. That was amazing. And I think for members who haven't made their way, you will be seeing them very soon. That was very inspiring. And I know my family and I will definitely be back. Um, and any information Molly sends our way for the 2022 season, I will be sure to send out to members too so that we can come visit. Thank you so much. Okay, great. So traditionally, members at our annual meeting have shared stories of um, if they have completed their quest during the year, and this year we were gonna do it if you have completed your quest in 2020 or 2021, since we couldn't meet in person last year. So if there's anybody that wants to share a story um, right now, I can go ahead and pass the mic to you. I can come to you so you don't have to get up. But anybody wanna share any stories from completing their quests the last two years? Anybody at all? Does anybody want to share a memory of something they'd like to share from, from visiting a town in 2021, either a favorite place that they've been to that they think other members should know about? Oh, you want me to come down to you, Brenda? Or you come up here. Thank you, Brenda. 
anybody else, oh, and I will bring the mic to you if you don't mind, just so our live stream can also hear us. That would be great. Here you go. Thank you. I just wanted to add to Molly's list of sights to see in the Northeast Kingdom. If you haven't been there, everybody should go to the Haskell Opera House and uh, Library in Derby Line. I'm not sure if they're open right now just because of the border situation, but when things are better, everybody must go to the uh, Haskell Opera House. It's one of my favorite places, not just in the kingdom, but in the state. Thank you. I know that's on our list, my family's list to go visit. Anybody else would like to share any memory from a 251 trip over the year? Great. I will come back towards you. Okay, great. Oh, oh wait. Could, do you mind? Um, just because we have the live stream going, too, so our members at home can hear us. Great. Thank you. Just a word or two of wisdom. For those of you who have uh, visited some of the towns where nobody lives and you can't get to them, there are a few in the NEK. And uh, I was very surprised to find, uh, I think it was Arlington, I'm not sure, in far south west, another town where nobody lives. But if you're having trouble getting into places like Warner's Grant, um, Lewis, some of those places way up in the NEK, contact the um, Department of Fish and Wildlife. They have maps that they can send you and instructions on what what dirt roads to drive up and how far you have to walk before you realize that you're in some of these really obscure places. And believe me, <laughs> watch out for the mosquitoes. Be sure to go in the fall, but these places are really worth seeing. And nobody's there. <laughs> Thank you. All right, let me head back here. Great. And if you don't mind just using the, the, the microphone. I just wanted to share that the Vermont Rug Hookers Guild are also hooking in every, trying to hook in all 251 towns this year to kind of modify uh, to, to the same as the 251 Club. Okay. So uh, many of the members of the guild have, have hooked in a lot of different towns just for sort of a co-251 thing. Great. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Oh. This way. And I will hand you the mic. I wanted to ask, who has found Mount Holly? <laughs> so we found a farm that said Mount, we, uh, our task was to take a photograph that had the town's name in it. We found a farm uh, outside of the intersection where the Mount Holly Baptist Church was the c town center used and to used to be yeah. it burnt down in 1993 so the only way we found it was we found this farm that said Mount Holly dairy air and the farm farmer happened to be out on his tractor and we we approached him and he gave us the history of that community the, I had two questions. One is, there are some towns that we pass through that are not on the list, mm -hmm. and I wondered why for that. And then I also wondered why St. Um, White River Junction and Bellows Falls are not on the list. So first with um, Mount Holly, and I'll just I'll step back here again. Uh, so. All of you will be receiving the fall newsletter in a few weeks. And the woman that we are um, highlighting, a member, um, she writes the Happy Vermont blog. And she actually just did a blog post on Mount Holly, too. So, um, oh, with you. <laughs> oh, excellent. So uh, you can learn more about Mount Holly by going to her blog. And, and she will have an article. Uh, some, of the, some of the towns that you would think would be towns are really villages. I shouldn't say they're, they're villages within the town, and that's why they're not on the list. Um, but that's part of the fun, too, is trying to figure that out. And I know I've, I'm always happy if you if you have a question about why is a, a village isn't on the list, reach out to me. And Yeah, I think it's the, what was it? Right. Mm -hmm. 
Right, and and Bellows Falls too. I remember when we went to check it off, we were surprised as well. But right, the explanation here, and that's part of the fun. Thank you so much. You you made me get up. <laughs> so Mount Holly, uh, the village, is Belmont. People come to Belmont and say, "Well, where's Mount Holly? We have Hillville." I mean, you people know, probably Cheese, Hortonville, Tarbellville. I mean, you, you know all these places. Stuff. So next time, come to Belmont. I'm the mayor. <laughs> my, 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 my father was the mayor. It, he, he was postmaster and had the store. So we grew up working there. So, so come to Belmont. I've been on the Historic Society for 42 years. I'll give you a village tour, a town tour, a cemetery tour. Uh, you know, you, you get it, and we're now the home of Vermont's terrestrial fossil. We're co-fossils with the shallot whale. We have the Mount Holly mammoth tusk on permanent loan from the University of Vermont, and I'm sorry you have to get up and say something, but when you talk about Mount Holly, you were in North Mount Holly, a couple churches have burned there, but you really need to visit the village of Belmont. That's great. Thank you so much. So I think um, we are ready for the raffle drawing, and I think Brenda's going to help out here and draw some names. So, one second. so before we do the raffle drawing, I just wanted to thank the businesses who do donated the raffle items, um, and also the members and businesses who donated for the silent auction as well. And and give a special thank you to board member um, Hubie Norton, who put a lot of effort and time organizing the silent auction. Um, and I think he's in the other room, but <laughs> thank you to Hubie as well. So for the, de for the raffle, we have two passes to Hodeen, the Lincoln Family Farm. If you haven't been there yet in Manchester, it's a wonderful place to go and, and learn the history of the Lincoln family. We have a Martha Stevenson print of Bennington that is a framed limited edition signed in number. And Martha Stevenson is also a 251 Club member. I don't think she could be here today with us, um, but she, had, she donated the framed limited edition. And then the gift basket from the Hearth and Home Country Store, which was donated, Hearth. oh, sorry, Hearth. Hearth. Hearth and, come, and that was donated to us as well. Um, so thank you to them. And then, of course, thank you to everybody who bought tickets for the raffle, donated to the club, and au auctioned and, and for being here as well. You ready, Brenda, for your? I guess. <laughs> Okay, so first we're going to draw for the Marth or for the two passes to Hodine. So I draw my own name. Oh, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I just have one little, just one. Just Here we go. Do you want me to? Sander, Sandy Monty, and hopefully. Oh, you oh. great. Thank you. Two passes to Hodine. Thank you so much. And. If you um, go, for any raffle winners, if you go to the silent auction checkout table, you can get your pass there. Thank you so much for buying raffle tickets. Okay. Next up is the Martha Stevenson print. There we go. <laughs> Did you want to read it? So Rod Durrell, who I believe is watching us via the live stream. Um, so, Rod, you are the winner of the Martha Stevenson print. Thank you for buying a raffle ticket. And last one, the gift basket. Okay. And Paulette Stotts, who is also watching online, I believe, with us. So thank you, Paulette, and you are the winner of the gift basket. And thank you again. So this, oh, thank you. <laughs> So this wraps up our 66th annual meeting. Um, please continue to share your stories. I love hearing from all of you. I love getting the emails of stories, um, you know, when I can featuring members in the newsletter too or, or sharing it on social media. It's really, it's the, my favorite part of this job is hearing from all of you about your stories. So thank you for that. And of course, if you have any suggestions for the club, also reach out to me. That's, that's how we can grow. And, um, offer more and more to all of you, our members. And I hope that next year we s are able to meet again in person. This has been great meeting in person and, and seeing everybody, and, and we'll have the live stream option next year as well. So thank you uh, for being here.
and I hope everybody has a great fall exploring Vermont. Thank you.